Um, Mr. President, after weeks of secrecy, after no engagement with the public, after an effort to prevent not only Democrats in this body, but women in this body from participating in putting together a new health care bill. Last week, we saw Senate Republican leaders put forward their bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Like its companion bill in the House, this legislation imposes draconian cuts to Medicaid, our nation's principal program for insuring children, to people with disabilities, and to seniors in nursing homes. It drives up costs for middle and low income Americans while delivering huge new tax cuts to the wealthiest in this country. Um, and, you know, I start with the premise that you can't take health insurance away from 22 million Americans and call it reform or better care. I think President Trump was accurate when he described this approach simply as mean. The fact is that this legislation is a direct threat to the health and well-being of millions of Americans, including tens of thousands in New Hampshire. The opioid epidemic in the country and in New Hampshire is the worst public health crisis in modern history in New Hampshire. Thanks to the expansion of Medicaid done by a Republican legislature and a Democratic governor, my colleague from um, New Hampshire who is now in the Senate, who is here with me today, thanks to their bipartisan work, nearly 11,000 Granite Staters have been able to access life-saving treatment under the Medicaid program for substance use disorders. By completely reversing the Medicaid expansion, the Senate bill that was released last week would cost who knows how many lives. It would be a crippling setback in our fight against the opioid crisis. Medicaid covers one out of three children in New Hampshire, as well as people with disabilities and seniors in nursing homes. In concert with the President's budget, this bill that's being proposed by the Senate would cut Medicaid funding in half by the year 2027. Cuts of that magnitude simply cannot be done without having devastating effects on children and other vulnerable people across New Hampshire. And then, of course, this legislation blocks all federal funding for Planned Parenthood. We have more than 12,000 Granite State women and men who depend on Planned Parenthood for essential health services, including cancer screenings. According to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, nearly 45,500 Granite Staters would lose coverage under the Republican leader's bill. These are people who rely on that coverage for basic care as well as for treatment of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses. And they are deeply afraid that they will be among the 22 million Americans who will lose their health coverage if the Senate bill becomes law. So last Friday, Senator Hassan and I convened an emergency public field hearing in Concord. We wanted to hear directly from Granite Staters who would be affected by the Senate bill. And I have to say, and I'm sure my colleague agrees with me, it was an extraordinary event. With over 200 attendees, they overflowed the overflow room. And this is a picture of um, the room where we held the hearing. And you can see people lined up on either side of the room waiting to take their turn to testify. Senator Hassan and I heard firsthand from health care providers, from people in recovery from substance use disorders, from parents of children with chronic diseases and disabilities, and so many others who are concerned about this legislation. We listened to emotional, heartfelt statements about the uncertainty, anxiety, and anger that this Senate bill has caused. I was especially moved by testimony from parents who are worried that their children will lose access to the life-saving treatment they need that, for so many of these kids, is the difference between life and death. People like Paula Garvey of Amherst, New Hampshire, who talked about her 19-year-old daughter, Rosie, who was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis just two weeks after birth. Rosie also suffers from juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. 
Rosie must follow a strict regimen of medications to keep the cystic fibrosis under control. And Paula fears that the repeal of the Affordable Care Act and cuts to Medicaid will leave her daughter without coverage for her pre-existing conditions, that insurance companies will once again impose a lifetime dollar on limits, on benefits, and for Paula and for any parent, the prospect of not being able to access life-saving care for your child is profoundly upsetting. Paula said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do if the Affordable Care Act goes away. What will Rosie do when she's off of our insurance and she's not able to find insurance again? Sarah Sadowski of Concord testified about her nine-year-old daughter who has cerebral palsy. She said, and I quote, the Affordable Care Act was a huge moment of hope. I can't face what life would look like with pre-existing conditions, lifetime limits, and countless hours on the phone with insurance companies. At the field hearing, we also heard important testimony about others who rely on Medicaid. For example, Medicaid provides coverage for more than 10 million Americans with disabilities and nearly 6 million seniors in nursing homes. In fact, these two groups alone account for nearly two-thirds of all Medicaid expenditures. And yet the Republican leaders' plan to cut Medicaid funding in half over the next decade would have dire consequences for these Americans. Brendan Williams, who's the CEO of the New Hampshire Healthcare Association, told our hearing that 63% of nursing home residents in New Hampshire rely on Medicaid. And as was reported on Sunday in the New York Times, the deep cuts to Medicaid included in the Senate bill would force many retirees out of nursing homes or lead states to require residents' families to help pay for care. For many families, this just not is just not an option. They don't have the finances to be able to do that. And so what happens? Their loved ones get kicked out of their residential care. So we also heard compelling testimony from health care providers who treat people with substance use disorders. Melissa Fernald is a private clinician in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. And she told us, quote, for the majority of Medicaid expansion patients, it's the first time they've had health insurance. It allowed me to assist them in properly diagnosing their mental health conditions and securing primary care providers to treat their medical needs. It has been a powerful experience to watch them heal and grow as a result of receiving proper care. My clients are more motivated and capable of getting a job and gaining financial independence. Again, if, if your heart is not moved by the morality of these kinds of stories by the values that I think we should have in this country to help people who need help. We should be moved by the economics of this. It's going to cost a whole lot more when we keep kick people with substance use disorders off of their insurance, when they go to emergency rooms to get their care, when they die, than it is to make sure they get the help they need. The Senate bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act and radically cut Medicaid is a threat to health care coverage for people in New Hampshire and in every other state in this country. I am so grateful to all of those Granite Staters who attended our field hearing on Friday. And I know that in other states across this country, large numbers of people are turning out to express overwhelming opposition to the Republican leader's bill. I heard this morning that polling shows that just 17 percent of Americans support this legislation. We need to listen. We need to stop this headlong rush to pass a cruel and heartless bill. For ordinary people in New Hampshire, the people that Senator Hassan and I heard from on Friday, repealing the Affordable Care Act and gutting the Medicaid program isn't about politics. It's a matter of life and death. We need to listen to the voices of ordinary people whose lives and finances would be turned upside down by this bill. There is a better way forward for both the Senate and our country. 
It is time for Republicans and Democrats to put ideology and partisanship aside to come together to do what's right for ordinary working people in this country. The majority leader's decision to delay a vote on the bill is an opportunity for all of us in the Senate. When we come back after next week's July 4th recess, let's come together in an open and inclusive process. The right way forward is for Republicans and Democrats to work together to strengthen the parts of the Affordable Care Act that are working, including Medicaid expansion, and to fix what's not working. According to poll after poll, this is what the majority of the American people want us to do. It is time now to respect their wishes to strengthen the Affordable Care Act so it works for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.